One of the fruits of Paul's ministry was the establishing of the church at Thessalonica. Although Paul was with them for only a short period of time, he bonded tightly with those new Christians there. He was their spiritual father in the faith, and because of that, they were his spiritual children. In 1 Thessalonians, there is a preservation of the relationship between the apostle and the believers in Thessalonica, and it serves as an inspired portrait of the traits which should be possessed and manifested by a faithful father in his relationship with his child or with his children. On Mother's Day, I spoke to the mothers of our congregation, and so today I'm speaking to the fathers of our congregation. But the principles I'm going to be sharing with us today are principles that we can transmit to others. Because one of the things that I have learned as a father is that fatherhood is one of the most difficult assignments in life, and one for which men many times are least prepared. Now, don't raise your hands, but how many of you fathers, how many of you men had a course in school on fatherhood? I didn't ask you to raise your hand, but if I had, in probability, very few hands would have been raised. I did not have a single course on being a father. Again, don't raise your hands, but how many of you dads, men, had a dad who shared with you, not about the birds and the bees, but about the subject of fatherhood. If I'd asked you to raise your hands, probably very few of you would, raise, had, would have raised your hand. My dad did not share with me along those lines. He did tell me this, son, girls are different from boys. <laughs> Women are different from men. And it didn't take me long to discover that he was a true prophet along those lines. <laughs> There's an old proverb that goes like this. One cannot determine the success of being a father until their children complete their parenting task. I read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11. Paul is writing to his children in the faith. And it says, as you know how we have exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, and underscore these words, as a father doth his children. So there was a parallel in the relationship of the Apostle Paul with his children in the faith at Thessalonica, a parallel that we physical fathers can draw insight from, and I'm going to share those with you today. But before I do, I want to ask you a question. What will you and I as fathers, what will you and I as dads be remembered for? If we die before Jesus returns, and our children stand at our memorial service, and the days following, what will we be remembered for? With that question in our minds and in our hearts, we're going to notice four traits, four traits of a faithful father that are outlined in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Number one, Paul possessed and manifested gentle affection for his spiritual children. 
And just as Paul possessed and, and manifested gentle affection for his spiritual children, even so dads, fathers, are to possess and manifest affection for their child or children. Look at verse number seven and underscore these words. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes this, her children. Now, what I'm sharing with you today is not spoken by one who was and is an expert in these four traits. I came short in many areas. And I wish someone had shared this sermon with me before I became a father. He said, we were gentle among you. I did not experience that growing up. My dad died when I was very young. My mother married again. There were five of us boys, four when she married, and one more was born into the family. And my stepdad, I always called him my dad, was not gentle with us. This is not being critical of military service, but he was in the Marine Corps, and he operated with us five boys like he did in the military. He was not gentle with us. But this type of gentle affection that Paul is talking about is mild and it's kind. And it flowed from a deep, unconditional love for them. It consisted not only of a warm inward attachment, but it consisted of an unconditional commitment to them. And this type of gentle affection, it can be sensed by children. I knew as a young boy that my dad, my stepdad, was not gentle. I sensed that. But it must be a relationship between a father and his child or children. It must be. Second trait. Paul imparted his very life. He imparted his soul, if you will, not just words, into the very fabric of his spiritual children. And just as the Apostle Paul invested and imparted his very life into his spiritual children, even so dads, fathers, are to impart his life, our very life, into the fabric of our child or, or our children. Look at verse number eight. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing, and a score, to have imparted unto you. Now, what is he going to talk about? What kind of impartation did he make? He said, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only. He did that. But underscore this, but also our own souls. And as if someone is about to ask, well, Paul, why would you do this? Why would you possess and manifest this trait with your spiritual children, he says, because ye were dear unto us. <laughs> That's why Paul did it. And just as Paul imparted his very life, his soul, into the fabric of his spiritual children, even so, dads, fathers, are to impart their life, their very soul, into the fabric of a child or children. Why? Because they are dear unto us. What's this saying? It's saying that the Apostle Paul did not withhold anything 
he shared with them not only from his lips the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he shared his life as well. And I believe with all of my mind and all of my heart because of personal experience that a, for a father to share his life takes time. But even though it takes time, it is a vital way to demonstrate how dear that child or those children are to us. And listen to me, dads, fathers. Sometimes this means there needs to be a house cleaning of attitudes. Because attitudes, many times, can be more lethal than our words or our actions. A number of years ago, I wrote a book on the Beatitudes, how we are to be in regard to, to that first sermon that Jesus presented, that Sermon on the Mount, we call it. And I wrote the manuscript and the book, and I was wrestling with a title. I could not come up with a title for that new book. Days went into weeks, and weeks went into a couple of months, and I, I could not think of a title that was fitting for, for this new book. One day I came out of my devotions, and I remembered a conversation that I had with our oldest daughter, Salome. She was about six or seven years of age at that time, and we had had a heated discussion about something a couple of days later. And on this one particular day, after that heated discussion, this little six or seven year old daughter of mine came up to me with a big grin on her face and this is what she said, Daddy, I think you need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> now, I don't know where she heard that, but when she said that, God's sweet spirit said to my spirit, that's the title for the book. And so the book is called Attitude Adjustment. Dads, sometimes we need an attitude adjustment, whether we like to admit it or not. Third trait. Paul was an example of unselfish, hard work as a tent maker. And he did so in order not to be a burden to his children in the faith. And just as Paul was an example of unselfish hard work, even so a dad, a father, must be a role model for his child or children. Look at verse number nine. For you remember, brethren, underscore, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Now follow me very closely. The call to be a business or a professional man should not be in conflict with our call to be a father. May I repeat that? The call to be a business or professional man should not be in conflict with our call to be a father. There were a number of things that I did when our girls were growing up that I wish I could go back and change. I have apologized to both of them, to Salome and to Shalimar, and asked them to forgive me. There were times when I put more emphasis on my profession than I did my role as a father. There shouldn't be any conflict there. Now follow me closely. Whether we realize it or not, a father is a never-to-be-forgotten memory in the eyes of a child. 
And the meaning of diligence, the meaning of discipline, the meaning of determination regarding work are either planted for the positive or for the negative. Now, having said this, this is not to say that a father may never rest, okay? But on the other hand, it also means that work must never become the God of the Father. See, our children need a role model, especially in the days in which you and I are living, of a father who is diligent, a father who is disciplined, a father who is determined in regard to work ethics because that father, we fathers, are influencing our children toward work. And again, I say either for the positive or for the negative. My earthly father was a lazy, lazy, lazy man. He would not work. I remember the day that the bank came and repossessed our automobile because he was too lazy to work and could not make the car payments. I remember sitting on the front porch with my three brothers and my father leaning back in a chair with his feet propped up on the banister rail, laughing as my mother walked down the sidewalk from the textile mill with cotton in her hair, laughing at her. I remember the day that he was laughing so robustly that my brother, just younger than me, picked up a piece of watermelon and threw it in my father's face. I remember that. My earthly father died when I was young. And I stood at the foot of his coffin, looking across his cold body. And I wasn't a Christian at that time, but I prayed this prayer. God, please help me not to grow up to be like my dad. You see, we are impacting our children. And in the generation we need, our young people need good role models in regard to work ethics. Trait number four. Paul took the, spir the spiritual lead as a spiritual father. And so must a faithful father take the spiritual lead in regard and tone for his family. Look at verse number 10. Ye are witnesses... And God also, underscore, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. In studying the scriptures, it's very clear that many times a child's view of our Heavenly Father is linked with a child's view of his or her earthly father. And a faithful father must take the spiritual lead in three ways. Look at verse number 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children. Listen to me carefully. A faithful father must take the spiritual lead by exhorting the children. Now, what does exhort mean? It means to encourage. In fact, this word in the original carries with it the connotation of, of pleading. So it's not just encouraging, it's begging. And we do so through teaching and, and through instructing. A faithful father must take 
the spiritual lead by comforting. What does it mean to comfort? It means to be there when trials and, and temptations come to our offspring. A faithful father must take the spiritual lead by charging. Now, this is a very interesting word in the original because it literally means to urge through our testimony or through our witness. Ralph Waldo Emerson made a statement that impacted me when I was just a young preacher boy growing out, uh, up, and, and I thought about it so many times since then. He said, what we are speaks so loud I can't hear what you're saying. You see, it's one thing to instruct them with our lips. It's one thing to comfort them. We can do that and really not be sincere. But it is, as we say in my port of Georgia, a horse of a different color to be the testimony, the witness that our child needs. So you see, it's not just our lips. It must be the totality of our lives. And so the question we need to ask is this. Why are these four traits we've looked at so important in the context of a faithful father? Why? They are important because in Paul's relationship with the church at Thessalonica, they would make an investment in the life and living in the journey of his spiritual children. And even so, these four traits of a faithful father will make an investment in the life and living the journey of a physical child or children. Look at verse number 12. That you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now listen to me carefully. Being a faithful father means trusting God for the process as well as for the product. Walt Worthy, he says. What's he saying? He's saying, act up to your high calling. Don't settle for anything less than best. God has given you a high calling as his children. Act up to it. And so I repeat, a faithful father involves trusting God for the process as well as for the product. He says, trusting God. He says, who hath called you unto his kingdom. Now, that has to do with the present kingdom of grace that Paul was operating then in and the kingdom of grace that you and I are operating in today. And so again, I repeat, being a faithful father involves trusting God for the process as well as for the product. He says, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. What's that referring to? That's referring to the future kingdom that God wants us to be a part of, his eternal kingdom that Jesus is returning to transport us into. So we are interested in the process and we're interested in the product because the process will determine the product. The product will be determined by the process. In conclusion, I want to quote from one of my favorite writers. It's from a work titled Ministry of Healing, pages 391 and 392. Fathers, do not discourage your children. Combine affection with authority, kindness, and sympathy with firm restraint. 
Give some of your leisure hours to your children. <laughs> Become acquainted with them. Associate with them in their work and in their sports. I think one of the, the best things I ever did for my girls was to teach them how to play softball. When Rebecca and I found out that we were expecting our first child, I wanted a boy so much. I envisioned him spouting Greek and me teaching him how to play baseball. And back then, they didn't have those tests to predetermine what you were going to have. And so when the nurse came out and laid her in my arms, I must confess to you that I was a little disappointed because I wanted a boy so much. But I looked down into her eyes, and I fell in love with her immediately. She captivated my mind and heart. And when we found out that we were expecting a second child, there was no fault in my mind and heart about having a boy. I wanted another girl all the way. <laughs> and so I taught my girls how to play softball. And I taught them how to fish. Fathers, are you listening to what she's saying here? Let me repeat it. Become acquainted with them. Associate with them in their work and in their sports. Why? And win their confidence. Cultivate friendship with them especially with your sons, in this way, you will become a strong influence for good. God is calling for men today to have a strong influence for good because Jesus is returning for children of Heavenly Father. I'm going to ask all the dads to stand, if you will. All the dads that are here today, would you stand up? Amen. Here comes Miss Patty. She's going to help me. We have an appreciation gift for you. It's a little different than, than what you would normally expect. It's something to help you to keep your shoes shined. One of the lessons that my dad, my stepdad, taught us boys was, boys, you can dress real nice, but unless your shoes are shined, you are not dressed properly. <laughs> I mean, he still had the little shoe shine box. Now, you young people, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about, but he still had the shoe shine box that he used as a young boy to shine shoes on the corner to make money. And so we're giving to the dads here a little token of appreciation. It says, God's direction is always best. He will be our guide, Psalm 48 and verse number 14. Miss Patty, do you have someone to help you with this? I think so. Okay. Okay, where are all my children? Stand up. Y'all come up here now, okay? Take one to your father, and then if there's another father there, give it to them. Tell them, tell them Happy Father's Day. We want to wish you a very happy Father's Day. After you receive your gift, don't be seated, fathers. Please remain standing. Every father have one. Okay, next Sabbath, I'm going to be looking down. 
I'm going to be checking all of these shoes that are going to be walking in here, okay? Uh, you mothers, you, you, you ladies, would you help me? Would you, would you do that? Okay, check them before they leave the house so Pastor Dan won't be disappointed. Brethren, Rebecca and I want to wish you a happy Father's Day. And I want you to always remember you are special. Special not because of who you are, but special because of whose you are. Father God, as me, these men stand in your presence, we thank you as a church family for them. And Father, I am asking that you will forgive us of shortcomings that we may have been a part of. Help us right where we stand to come to a clear understanding of fatherhood. Some of us are aged in our relationship with our children, but we have grandchildren. We have other young boys and young men in this church that need role models and they need mentors. So Father, help us to take seriously these four traits that we have looked at through the Apostle Paul and to make a fresh determination that we are going to be more vital in the process and the product of making sure that children, whether ours physically or not, are ready when Jesus returns. Because this prayer we pray and praises for victories we give in Christ's name, amen. I invite you to stand together with me. Thank you. <laughs> that was sweet. She said, happy Father's Day. I invite you to stand together with me as we blend our voices together. Number 304, Faith of Our Fathers. 304. 